Turn to uh, 473. 473. Jesus never fails. Do some thinking this week on Gene's questions. Good question. Maybe you'll have something to contribute next week uh, regarding this whole issue of, you know, if it's possible that even the elect could be deceived. But we have a lot of people who say they sin every day. They've been deceived. They don't. They probably don't. They shouldn't. And uh, etc. Good. Good. Good point. All right. <clears throat> Earthly friends may prove untrue, doubts and fears assail. One still loves and cares for you, one who will not fail. Jesus never fails, Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away. But Jesus never fails. Though the sky be dark and drear, fierce and strong the gale, just remember He is near and He will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never fails. In life's dark and bitter hour, love will still prevail. Trust His everlasting power, Jesus will not fail. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus never fails. Amen. All right, by way of announcements, we're up. Uh, have our evening service tonight at six o'clock, and Wednesday night we'll have our uh, Wednesday night service. Um, next week is Father's Day, next Sunday, and we're going to have our regular morning service. But then uh, a family, Coke family, is going to leave after church and go to Florida, uh, and they spend what? How many days is it going to be, Megan? Four. Seven total. Oh, seven total. But we'll be back for Sunday, the following Sunday. So we won't have Sunday night, and we won't have Wednesday night that week. So just kind of give you a heads up. We will have our business meeting after church. We put it off. We had everything ready to have it the first week when they put this uh, thing into this band in. So we'll have it a after church today. And uh, we still want to have a picnic around the 4th of July at our yard. And then when Reuben comes in August, we'll just have another one, you know. But I, I do want to have a little fellowship together uh, in, in June. Any other announcements that need to be made? Oh, by the way, Reuben made an interesting comment. He said, yeah, the governor out here has said, maybe you heard this, you can walk on wet sand, but you can't walk on dry sand. Yeah, that's what the governor of California said. If you go to the beach, you can walk on wet sand, but you can't walk on dry sand. Now, this, this is the insanity. People have, they've actually gone nuts. They've lost, their, this guy's a governor of a huge, largest state, I mean, population-wide, largest state in the union, and he's uh, telling his... Uh, employees that uh, you know you could you could <laughs> and I will I will encourage you by the way go to Janesville if you want to go shopping enjoy yourself and not to worry about anything we actually went to a gun shop and there's a sign out front no mask allowed in this store <laughs> I went in and said yeah I love it <laughs> what that's good yeah the guy behind us he took a picture of it with his phone when he came before he came in <laughs> So you have to bring a huge bucket of water and then pour on the sand and then step? I guess that's what you'd have to do. You'd have to bring your own five-gallon bucket of water. Pardon me? You'd probably get fined for wasting water. Yeah, they do so. Well, it just shows that there's no common sense at all in anything that's going on in our country right now. None whatsoever. So I would encourage you. It's a nice drive up to Janesville. There's a little construction there, but you can still zip along at 70 miles an hour in most cases. And this man, oh man, the traffic is crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, there's people everywhere in Janesville getting around. Shops are all full of people, and a lot of most of them didn't wear masks. So I was glad for you. Don't you don't have to in Wisconsin. It's not uh, mandatory. So just pray for our building that they will kind of come to their senses. Things they got going on, like yeah. Well, anyway, praise God. 569. 569. Oh, that will be glory for me. When by His grace I shall look on His face. Hey, folks, don't give up. Don't lose hope. There's still hope for our country. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't, you just don't want to give up. Keep praying. Keep being, living your righteous life. Uh, you know, God can do more with w one man than the world can do with a hundred thousand. You know, one man with, with God's, you know, many examples where he's used one man to defeat entire armies. Mm -hmm. So, yes. And don't forget, our country has been in dire straits many, many times. Many times, yes. This isn't the first. No. Sure. And, we, and we need the Christians to be strong. And remember, we have hope, right? Our hope is built on Jesus Christ. We don't just hope in this world alone. In fact, if, you, if all you're doing is hoping in this world at the economy and your house and your job, you're to be pitied, the Bible says. You're most pitiable. Our hope is in the resurrection and in the life which is to come. Because remember, when you leave, you everything stays behind. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. And thieves do not break in and steal. Boy, is that appropriate. <laughs> Lay up treasures in heaven. And, uh, you know, we may be considered the scum of the earth here, but we're going to be considered the heroes of heaven when we get there. Saints. Amen. All right. When all my labors and trials are o'er And I am safe on that beautiful shore just to be near the dear Lord I adore Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me Glory for me, glory for me When by His grace I shall look on His face that will be glory, be glory for me. When by the gift of His infinite grace, I am accorded in heaven a place, just to be there and to look on His face, will through the ages be glory for me. All that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Friends will be there I have loved long ago, Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile from my Savior I know Will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me, glory for me. When by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. A couple of notifications here. I keep forgetting all this stuff. Sorry. Um, got a little card from Jed and Cindy thanking the saints. Dear saints, I love that. Dear saints, you, you know that's what you are? You're either a saint or you're an eight. So we are saints, and you shouldn't be afraid. Say, no, my name's safe, Saint Bill. My name is Saint Jean. You know, you're not Sinner Bill, I hope, or Sinner Jean. You're Saint. One of the two, folks, either Sinner or Saint. 
Thanks for your generous gift of $500, which is our weeks, every uh, quarter we send them our tithing. Uh, Brother Jed and company appreciate your sacrifice to help us reach the college students with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord give you and your family 100 fold in your investment in the kingdom and in his service, Brother Jed and Sister Cindy. Then we received a card from the Carlson family. Sister Pat uh, gave it to Paula. A real nice card. God is love, and you all have showered His love to others. We are so thankful. Please keep prayers for Robin for her continued improvement. Remember, she was, what was it, uh, Larry? Seven weeks she was stuck someplace? Yeah, in, the, in Chicago. In Chicago. But she's doing better. And uh, so she's. we feel truly blessed. By all the many prayers you have bestowed upon all of us, especially Robin and her family, on her journey with her leukemia. Our heart is happy. We got a call yesterday from Sandy and said that they found two new tumors on, in her daughter. One in under, Robin? Yeah, in, in Robin, right. In one okay. under the armpit and one in the, in the stomach area. Oh boy. Well, here's a picture of Robin and her two kids she sent along. We can pass that around. So the robin's in the middle, the two kids are on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, just keep keep her in your prayers, okay? And Pat, how, she's just still suffering with weakness, isn't she? Uh, she had the gout. The gout, okay. Uh, she's on medication for that. Yeah. She's walking around, but she uses a cane. Okay. Okay, we'll keep praying for Pat. And uh, we don't know about... Uh, any more about uh, Sister Joyce, but she won't. An she hasn't answered uh, Opal's calls. Is her birthday today or yesterday? Yesterday. 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 And um, Jesse just said she wasn't feeling a little under the weather last night. She called, but she's hoping to come to church tonight. So there's nothing, nothing, uh, you know, we need to worry about with Jesse. All right, <clears throat> I want to finish up my message on steps in salvation and uh, I'm going to review we what we got through uh, seven I think six six, six. yeah so we're on justification justified step seven that's why I was pretty sure that's where we were all right Lord help us this morning in Jesus name that we might have a clear picture of what it is to walk with you and be saved as the Bible describes it, saved from sin. And we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Amen. Step seven, justified. Mechanism, truth indwelling and propelling becomes truth reconciling. What's the word reconcile mean? What's, cons what's cons concile or conciliatory? Anybody? He brought back in favor. Okay, uh, if you're conciliatory, you're like the olive branch. You're trying to bring peace. You're trying to be a peacemaker, would be someone who's conciliatory. So if you're reconciled, then you're trying to restore peace again, meaning there was some split or separation. There was a time of turmoil. Now you want to be reconciled again. Got it? The whole idea. And Paul talks frequently in the New Testament about you were once enemies of God, but now you have been brought into peace with God. We have peace with God. We are reconciled to God. Our God is a God of peace, isn't he? In fact, it says the God of peace. He's described that way in many places in the New Testament. So we certainly want to make this emphasis that Truth is reconciling. So the agents in this step, the penitent remembers that he was a sinner and sets his whole life to obey God. Romans 6, 19-22 For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now, remember, understood subject. You can put you. So now, you present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Your responsibility, as we've been talking about this morning. 
For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Remember, sin and righteousness are like oil and water. They don't mix. Got it? Don't mix. You can't have both. It's impossible to be both sinful and righteous. It's an either or, not a both and. Verse 21, Therefore, what benefit were you then, deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? And that's a good question. To ask a sinner, well, what benefit do you get from sin? He says, well, it makes me feel good. How long? <laughs> Paul, John describes them as the passing pleasures of sin. They're, they're pleasurable for a moment, but then, oh, it's not good. Guilt is a horrible thing. Uh, verse 22. Uh, for, for, well, the in, in of 21. For the outcome of these things is death. Verse 22. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Hey folks, that's the option. Two options. Eternal death or eternal life. Pretty simple. Now the saint, he's the other agent in this process, he receives the new saint into fellowship and communion, Philemon 1, 10 and 11. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, who I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. So, the person that was our enemy now becomes our friend. You know, they now become a co-worker in this great gospel effort. And the Godhead, their agents in this process of justification, forgets that we were sinners and reconciles us to intimate fellowship with themselves. Remember, there's three persons in the Godhead. And we don't just, just get reconciled to one and not to all of them. This is a, this is a family affair. We get, we get adopted into a family. Amen? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all the other uh, children. Uh, Titus 3, 7. So that being justified by His grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now the action under this step is justification is the earthly culmination of reconciliation. In other words, we have all kinds of people that say, well, justification by faith means that I can sin and still get to heaven. That's really what... In other words, uh, God... I'm still a sinner, but God doesn't uh, treat me like I'm still a sinner, even though I still am a sinner. But this, of course, is complete foolishness. This is disgraceful, as Harry Kahn would say, <laughs> to say that uh, God uh, re reconciles us but leaves us in the state that we were in. But that's not possible. That's like opposite of each other. So... Man has returned. The, uh, the, the thing that we have to understand, repentance means a change of mind and a change of motive. Both. Man turns around. He was facing one direction. He turns completely around and faces the other direction. Gordon Olshan used to say, uh, the sinner at repentance admits that he has been completely wrong and God has been completely right. <laughs> No, not even a little crumb that I was right. No, I'm completely wrong. God has received and restored and relates to him by grace. God graciously, once you've repented, turned away from your wickedness, God receives you and restores you. But, they, but that does not ever happen until you stop sinning. Got it? There's no... There's no compromise here. God say, well, you know, when I, when I was a kid, I used to go to Youth for Christ camp up at Lake Geneva. I had a Youth for Christ camp up there. And they would come, oh, the Youth for Christ preachers would come and preach at these messages, and they would say, now, tonight, just let Jesus in the front door. Just let Him in the living room of your life. Now, you, we got, you got sin in the bedroom, you got sin in the closet, you got sin in the kitchen, but just let Him into the living room. And then pretty soon you can let him into the bedroom. And then pretty soon you can let him in the kitchen. And boy, that closet, though, where you've got all those secret sins, that's going to be tough to find. But finally, 
Maybe, you know, God's going to get into that club. That's a big bunch of hogwash, folks. That's like getting married to a girl so you know I had four other girlfriends before you. And so I'll let one a year go. I'll still visit the other, you know, four, four, and then three, and then two, and then one. And after, and after five years, it, it'll just be you and me. What, what woman in her right, right, right mind would ever put up with that? None. Not exactly none. Nobody. But that's why we present God as though, oh, God's just so desperate to get his toe in the door that if you'll just... No, 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 folks. God comes in and he cleans house. Got it? Turns everything upside down. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. No compromise with God. No halfway with God. It's all or nothing. You know, when they talk about full surrender, Uncondi remember the unconditional surrender. That means no conditions. I give up. Whatever you, whatever you do is fine. But I give up. And that's all God takes. God considers or reckons the penitent, his child and friend, based on man's departure from sin and commitment to righteous living. The only reason God's going to consider you his friend is if you are his friend. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> We've got so many people, I, I don't get it. You don't know about being deceived, Brother Gene. <laughs> They think somehow they can be God's enemy, but still be God's friend. This is, it's almost inconceivable that we preach this stupid message. Well, you, we're all a bunch of sinners. We can't help but sin, but we're going to heaven. But they say we're covered by the Lord. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I know it's all that we talk about super irrigation this morning in Sunday school. You know what super irrigation means, Brother Dave? You do. You know what it means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That means Jesus... Uh, he was not only righteous for himself, but he, was, he had so much righteousness left over that he could give it to all of you. But the problem is, Jesus was a man. He could only be righteous for himself. He could only obey for himself. He couldn't obey for anybody else. Got it? So he expects you to obey for yourself. It's called righteousness. You're really supposed to be righteous. The same way Jesus was really righteous. How was Jesus righteous? He had to obey. Read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And thus, being made perfect, he became the, uh, he's, uh, the author of salvation to all who obey. That's Bible, folks. That's not some doctrinal book, uh, systematic theology that somebody wrote. That's Bible. We have to cease from sin and obey God. Isaiah 119, if you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. God's pretty simple. If you consent and obey, you'll, you'll be blessed. The result. Now the penitent is now related to God, it's related to by God, as if he had never sinned. So God basically treats you like you've never done anything against him. That's how he, that's the relationship. And by the way, why does God do it? Because he knows you you won't do anything against him again. He has faith that you'll live a holy life, that you won't sin anymore. God's not going to treat you if he has the scintilla of wonder that you might go back to your life of sin again. Every time Israel turned their back, God's shocked. He can't believe they did it. He writes through Isaiah, he says, What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done? God just frustrated. What more could I? He's asking the question. Somebody tell me what more I could have done than I did. And there's silence because God's done everything He can do. Amen? So God's like, what do I have to do to get people to follow me, to love me, to obey me? And the penitent reckons himself, considers himself, accepts by faith that he's dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. You have to, hey, hey folks, you cannot be a Christian without faith. You just accept by faith, I'm dead. I'm dead to sin. Even though you're alive and you could sin, you've got a free will, but say, nope, I'm dead to sin, not going to do it anymore. All done. By faith. 
I just reckon it so. It's Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Consider yourselves dead to sin. You do it. God's not going to do it. You do it. Now you're standing in state, reconciled and in relationship with God and His people. Change of consideration. Sin's okay. Now sin is deadly. I used to think sin was great. Not anymore. I want nothing to do with it. Paul says to Timothy, flee youthful lust. Get away. Run as fast as you can. Places you, if you, if you had a problem with something in the past, get away from it. Amen? The danger is that we should consider sin as an option. Romans 6.11 Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Sin is not an option under any circumstances. Alright, we'll do number... Well, I'll tell you what, before we go to 8, because that's... I don't want to... We've got only a few minutes left. I want to... Take your Bibles, if you've got your Bible this morning, open your Bible up. One of the biggest things, biggest problems in the church is the idea that we're not really saints until you die. Got it? That's a typical concept. And if you say, well, I am a saint, people say, you've lost your minds. You know, what, what, what in the world, what planet are you from? Actually, some people consider that to be a sin, to say... Oh, yeah, oh, I've had people say, you know, to say that you don't right. sin is a sin. And, of course, they misquote 1 John chapter 1, verses uh, 8 and uh, 10. They always misquote those two verses. Out of con they pull them out of context. Don't put them in the whole context. And Dave, was, he's chomping at the bit because he could preach well, an hour. That's the one sin that shows that you're not a Christian. Yeah. All the other sins you can be a Christian. You can brag you. about. You understand what he's saying? You but the one that. sin that says you're not a Christian is if you say you don't sin. Then you're not a Christian. But if you say, oh yeah, I, I screwed the next uh, lady next door the other day. Oh, that's okay. God will forgive you. Well, maybe not. But, you know, it is ludicrous, isn't it? Because they say, oh, I sin every day I thought we're needing the preacher. And then they find out the preacher stole all the money from the church and they say, get rid of the clown. What a bunch of hypocrites that I say, hey, nobody's perfect. Everybody sins. You know, that was to be expected that he'd steal all the money from the church and run off with the church secretary. What's the problem there? I'm, seriously. Why be embarrassed about it? Why don't you get up and brag? Like Megan's friend saw my license plate a number of years ago. Said, I'm going to get a license plate that says sin boldly. Remember, remember that, Megan? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he thought that was crazy. I saw some guy with a license plate. Don't sin. I'm going to get a license plate that says sin boldly. He's a good Lutheran. <laughs> All right. Forty times. Forty. I'm not going to, we're not going to go through every one of them. Forty times in the New Testament, Paul's writings, the word saint is used in the present tense. Not the future tense. Present tense. So we'll start in Romans chapter 1. Let's just flip through a few of these. Romans chapter 1 verse 7. <clears throat> we'll try to stick there's a bunch of them in Romans Romans 1 7 to those to all who are beloved of God in Rome called as saints we are called to be saints got it grace to you and peace from God our Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ now flip over to chapter 8 verse 27 Romans 8 27 And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he, the Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So it's God's will that the Spirit intercedes for saints, not for sinners. doesn't say he intercedes for sinners. He intercedes for saints. He convicts sinners. He's not, the Spirit of God is not interceding. Oh God, please don't send those sinners to hell! Oh, he's interceding for us. He's convicting the sinner. That's what Jesus said. Remember, when he comes, he'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So sinners are being convicted, but he's interceding for saints. So there have to be, there have to be saints or he can't be interceding for them. All right, chapter 12, verse 13. 
Chapter 12, verse 13. This is the part of the gifts that they, in Romans. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. That's what Roy and Mary are doing. They're contributing to the needs of the saints to have a place to meet. We can fellowship together. They're practicing hospitality. Roy makes those good meatballs every once in a while. Oh, yeah. Romans 15, 25. You don't have to imagine. You just brought those up. I got a couple packs. I <laughs> thought about that the other day, but I didn't think of Romans 15, 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints. Gee, it seems like that Paul thought there was a whole lot of people that were saints. Mm -hmm. Verse 26. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Verse 31. That I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judah, Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. Paul was, Paul was saying, I need to be acceptable to the saints. Isn't that interesting? Not only to God, but to the saints. Chapter 16, verse 2. That you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever she may have need of, uh, have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper to many and of myself as well. Verse, verse 15. Meet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. But we'll suffice that. But listen, I got a whole bunch more from 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Philemon. Saints. It's real. But why do you think that term's been removed from the church all these years? Well, because if they, if, because if they taught, used it, then their doctrine that we sin every day in thought, word, and deed would be thrown out the window. That's, that's the reason why. You know, these preachers, they want to have their fun, too. I remember a preacher telling, you know, you ever heard this, uh, the, the centimeter, a joke about the centimeter you've heard? You ever heard of it? Well, I, I, it was some big, it was uh, some big name like uh, Swindle, Chuck Swindle. And he was Stanley, Stanley, Stanley and Swindle telling us of the centimeter. When you get to heaven, the... You know, they have a centimeter that tells how much you're sinning. It's, it's terrible to make this joke. And the guy said, well, when so-and-so gets to heaven, they, he finds out it's his centimeter, they use it for a fan. Because it's going around so much, because he's sinning all the time. They, oh, 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 this is a big joke. No, I'm not, I heard it. I, I saw this guy get up and talk. It's like Charles Stanley talking about Chuck Swindle or somebody like that. That his centimeter is going around so much that they use it for a fan in heaven. And I thought, boy, they you know, you I, I wonder if God isn't going to place something like that back on Judgment Day and say, oh. I didn't think it's so funny. No, go ahead. Did God answer prayers of sinners? No. The Bible's very clear about that. The only prayer He'll answer is the repentant prayer. Mm -hmm. But the moment you repent, you've changed your mind. You've stopped your sin. You understand? Now, this is, not, this is godly sorrow. Godly repentance, not worldly repentance. Not sorry for getting caught but sorry that you did it, no matter what the consequences are. Brother Paris, on one of his tapes, says, we say to God, God, I don't, you know, if you'll have me, I don't care if you send me to hell in the end, if you'll just forgive me, that's what I'm looking for. In other words, we don't bar bargain and barter with God. You just come to God and say, here I am, if you'll take me, have me. I'll, I'm, I'll, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. Amen? All right, we'll look at the last two steps, persecution and glorification. Because, folks, persecution is a step in salvation, young ladies. Don't think you're going to be popular and loved and accepted. Because that's not the way it goes. Even your own family may think you're nuts. I know Megan's family, I think, thinks she's nuts for coming to this little church. But she doesn't seem to mind it. I mean, I don't know. She seems to love us. And uh, we love her. But, you know, your own family, mate. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a soul hurt. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be families broken up over this, over Christianity. That's why it's good to find a young man, like Sarah found, mm -hmm. like, of course, Hayden found a young woman that has a worldview that agrees with each other. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, you've you got a whole lot better chance of being serving God in persecution if you both have the same view of how things should be. So, anybody have anything you, in closing you'd like to say this morning? Anybody? How about an amen? Amen.